Next, I want to uh, bring up uh, Senator Paul Boyer. He's an Arizona State Senator for LD20. Please help me welcome Arizona Senator Paul Boyer. Good evening. My uh, interest in politics began about 20 years ago due to a country that's about 6,000 miles away that's been around for several thousand years that's probably had more invasions than any other country that I know of. In March of 2002, uh, there was a suicide bombing in Israel. It's now known as the Seder bombing. That's where there were mostly uh, elderly Jews, about 100, that were celebrating Passover. And the bomber comes in, blows himself up, and murders about 30 elderly Jews. I'm, I'm Christian. I'm not even Jewish. But that was kind of my aha moment, if you will, where I never in a million years <laughs> thought I was going to be involved in politics. I thought I was going to be a journalist or a pastor. I was the editor-in-chief at ASU West at the student newspaper. And the bombing happened. And it, I almost fell out of my chair. I, I just couldn't fathom why someone would want to do that. And so I just decided right then and there that I was going to learn everything I could about that issue. Being an English major, I printed every official state document from 1917 to 2002, <laughs> and I read all of them. <laughs> because I knew enough to know that everyone had their own thoughts on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and I didn't want any spin. I just wanted to know, okay, what was really going on? And through that, I got invited to Shabbat dinner uh, every Friday night at the Tempe campus. We called it the main campus at the time. And I was the, I guess, the token Christian, if you will. And, but we always talked about politics afterwards. And I stuck around, and then I found out about this trip to Israel. And I thought, oh, well, you probably have to be Jewish, and it's probably expensive, and I was broke. So, but then I heard the rabbi talking to you know, all the students at ASU, and hey, do you want to go on this trip? And finally, I, I got up the nerve, and I called Rabbi Lee, Barton Lee at the time, and I said, hey, I really want to go on this trip. I'll write anybody, I'll call anybody, I'll meet with anybody, I'll write essays, I'll do whatever it takes. He says, Paul, I'll call you back. He calls me an hour later, says, you leave in a week. And so I, I got to spend about a month in Israel. Uh, through that time, I, I met my then future boss, I didn't know that at the time, uh, a guy at APAC of the American Israel Public Affairs Committee. Uh, so I worked in DC for, uh, for about a year, and then I, I missed home a little bit and, and came back. And I've always needed a job, and there was always some kind of political job. And so <laughs> I ended up becoming the legislative liaison for the Department of Corrections here in Arizona. For about three years, I got fired. My then boss said, hey, I want you to record every conversation that you have with legislators. And I thought, A, that's unethical. And B, I said, do you want me to get legislation passed, or do you want me to tell you what I talked about? Because you can't have both. And then, I, I kid you not, she says to me, I, was, I got invited to happy hour by then um, Representative Bob Stump, just because he liked me. And there were going to be about five members there, and he says, uh, yeah, you know, why don't you come hang out with us? And I'm on my way out, and the deputy director, she says, where are you going? I tell her, and she says, unless you can justify in writing why this would benefit the department, you can't go. And I could have handled it differently. <laughs> I, I looked at her, and I said, what's wrong with you? <laughs> Needless to say, I didn't, it, I was not gainfully employed there for, for much longer. <laughs> then three months, uh, Kirk Adams picked me up. I did communications for the house. And I was so grateful because if you remember, that was the height of the, the fiscal crisis, the, the, the housing market crashed, and it was the worst time to be unemployed. I was unemployed. I was watching uh, Invincible, the movie, the true story about Vince Papali, every single morning to give me some motivation in filling out my job applications. It's the reason why I'm an Eagles fan today, to this day. And, and Kirk hired me, thankfully. And so I'd, for three years, I was on staff, and I thought I knew a, a little bit at least about public policy. You know, I was getting uh, maybe an inch deep in you know, education, healthcare, uh, maybe public safety, the three main buckets that, that we spend a lot on at the state legislature. And then, 10 years ago, redistricting. Never thought I'd run for office. Two out of my three state legislators both decided to retire, Linda Gray and Jim Wires. That never happens. I mean, there's two open seats. And so I thought, eh, why not? I've sold books door to door, door to door in South Carolina, and I'm used to getting rejected, so it can't be that much harder. 
I interned for my congressman, John Shattig, and so I, I'm used to knocking on doors for him, and so I knocked on a lot of doors that year and uh, made a lot of phone calls and for whatever reason became the top boat getter, and here I am 10 years later. And so, but what my colleagues don't get about me and what they don't understand is as far as what, what shaped me, you know, kind of like what I, how, how I make decisions, you know, at the state legislature, how I, um, you know, my thought process. And for me, you have to go back about 2,500 years. Now, Chuck's gonna bust my chops for, for bringing this up. But there, there's a quote that I can't get rid of for some reason. It's, in, it's from the Apology by Plato. And Socrates, who's on trial, uh, for corrupting the youth and believing in different gods and other trumped up charges. And he says, for anyone who wants to pursue justice must live a private and not a public life if they're going to survive for even a short time. Now, I don't know about you, but that it haunts me. It really does. And I wonder if he's right. And then there's another line that I can't get, get rid of. And that's, he says, Death is not something I could, I, I could care less about, but the one thing I do care about is that I commit no act of injustice. And so, for those of you who know me, I'm, I'm a busy guy. I, I teach part-time at PVCC. I have a three-year-old. He keeps me really busy. And it's been hard to get you know, meetings with me some, day, some of these days. So, um, a pro tip, if you want to get a meeting with me, just say you want to talk about Socrates or Cicero, <laughs> then you're, you're guaranteed to get a meeting. And so then there's, then there's Cicero. He's another guy that, that I look to. And at the time when Cicero uh, was around, first century BC, there were three, three main schools of thought. There's Epicureanism, Stoicism, and Platonism. And there's this curious line that he writes to his son. It's the last text that, last text that we have, the last... It's really a book, but it's a, a letter he wrote to his son. It's called On Duties. And he says that we all would like to be Socratic. We all, in other words, I, I think he's leaning towards Platonism, but what, so well, I'm sorry, what Cicero did is he, he took those three schools of thought, didn't really find himself in one of them, but he, he, he chewed the fruit and spit the, out the seeds, if you will. He took the best of all three and tried to to find what was best and, and, and live his life that way. And I, and I really think if he hadn't been assassinated, he would have been, been one of the best philosophers the, the world has ever seen. That's my opinion. I could be way off on that, uh, notwithstanding Plato. And so I, I like to do the same. I mean, the Wall Street Journal is one of my favorites. Uh, National Review, I've even come to, to love Ben Shapiro. Uh, but I also read everything on the other side. I mean, I read, I read The Nation. I'll read you know, everything that's out there because I'm looking for good arguments. And so... There, there's, there's one uh, legislator who doesn't have to knock. He can just walk in my office, and that's my good friend, Sean Bowie. <laughs> you know, he's a Democrat. I'm a Republican, but we talk. We, we do a lot of this. And, you know, sadly, we can't have discussion uh, given the, the venue, but we do. We, we enjoy uh, just talking and hashing through policy. We don't always agree, but we really enjoy just, okay, what do you think about this? Have you thought about this? I'm like, oh, no, I hadn't thought about that. And so um, I, I just think we need more of that. Uh, I am taking a political Sabbath uh, after 10 years. Uh, it's just, it's time. Uh, my wife and I want to have more kids and just want to get to know my son a little bit better than this crazy schedule here at the legislature. I do hope, though, moving forward, that I'm a little concerned, and, and I, I might sound critical of my party, only because it's my party, and I, I do love it, but I am concerned about a, a populist strain that seems to be permeating my party, uh, the normalization of deficit spending, I really am worried about that. I remember 10 years ago, uh, the Tea Party movement started because of the stimulus. It was $1 billion. Now it's like one billion, whatever, we'll just throw another few billion on and no big deal. And just, it seems like both parties are now normalizing deficit spending and that's a worry to me. And so I hope that's not where we're heading. Uh, I hope that we can get other elected officials that, that care about, uh, tackling debt like we did last year here in, in Arizona. Hopefully we can do more of that, and that's my story.